Welcome to the Messiantics Podcast, a podcast about all things Messianic Judaism. Each episode, we will be sharing our opinions as we tackle some of the biggest issues in Messianic Judaism. Now, here's your hosts, Rabbis Eric, David, Jonathan, and Toby. Shalom. I'm here today, and we're glad that you tuned in. Uh, This is Rabbi Eric. I'm joined with Rabbi Jonathan, Rabbi David, and Rabbi Toby. And we just returned recently from the rabbis' conference in Orlando. And uh, while we were there, we had great fellowship with good friends, hung out with people. But we also realized two things. One, that there is a, a, a growing group, not as large as I'd like to see yet, but a growing group of young leaders who are feeling called to enter into Messianic ministry. But the other side of the coin is that there's a large group of senior leaders who are actually senior, senior. Now they're getting older. And uh, so we, we were talking and, and uh, about the, the issue of what happens next. Uh, thankfully, our congregations have uh, a plan in motion for what happens. God forbid one of our senior leaders go. We have assistant rabbis in place. We have people that are there, but there's a lot of congregations that do not have a succession plan. Matter of fact, it appears that some of them, their only plan for succession is the rapture. You know, mm-hmm. the rapture happens, they don't need to have somebody come in and take their place, but up until then, they don't really have that. But we don't want to get sidetracked too much into the what happens next plan as the what happens if we don't have a what's happening next plan. Right. In other words, if if you don't have somebody in place to uh, fill in the gap, it leaves this huge vacuum mm-hmm. within the community. And we've seen this happen as uh, not only with senior leaders, but with worship leaders or, or others who, for various reasons, someone gets sick and can't be there, uh, someone dies and can't be there, someone's job transfers them, and suddenly they're having to leave and they've held a key position in the congregation and uh, there hasn't been a a secession plan in place for these positions, these roles, and it causes uh, a, not only a vacuum which brings in both. You know, the the other day an airliner was flying, and the door went off. Mm-hmm. You know, just a big hole in the plane, and it when that happens, it sucks everything toward the hole. Right. And in a community, in a congregation, when a vacuum is caused, it sucks everything, both good and bad, toward the whole. And, and if we're not careful, we'll just grab the closest thing to us and throw it in that place and hope that it works out. Right. So we're going to have a, a nuanced talk more about that in the case. And again, this is messy antics. We're talking about the antics or the things that make us different, unique, and uh, and both good and bad within our movement. So... Uh, that's what we kind of want to talk about today. So I want to dive in this and, and bring up the uh, there's this old adage that I've heard forever, especially from old military guys. You know that to uh, to fail to plan is to plan to fail. And uh, what ends up happening in a lot of these situations is and and here's the reality about it: messianic congregations, for the most part, I mean, you, you've got your outliers like you do sometimes in the church world and whatever you. But for the most part, messianic congregations are very adamant about being good stewards. Mm-hmm. Right? We're we're cautious to steward the resources that come in. We're cautious to steward the building. We're cautious to steward the relationships and so on. But the the reality is, stewardship goes beyond that. Right? Uh, Rabbi Toby and I were talking about this on the way here. Um, God gives us a congregation. He gives us a leadership team. He gives us people in the seats. He gives us people serving in various avenues of ministry in the congregation. Uh, and it's our responsibility to steward them. But that doesn't just go from the day-to-day operation. That goes into, well, what happens if, right? I had a conversation with a, a Messianic leader a few years ago. Um, the senior rabbi or, or the, the only rabbi in their congregation uh, almost died a few years ago. And I was having a conversation uh, with with a few leaders about this very issue. Like, you know, why are there no transition succession plans? What can we do to better facilitate like modeling this for people and giving somebody a baseline they can work with to develop this and what have you? And uh, and this other leader pops in and goes, oh, at our congregation, we've got a phenomenal transition plan or succession. I think he said succession plan. We've got a phenomenal succession plan. I was like, oh. Well, I, I'd really like to hear that because your rabbi almost died, you know, uh, 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 this last year. I'd really like to hear what your succession plan is. And I had my doubts, 
that there was something that could be called a succession plan, but I was willing to hear it out because if there is, like, there's a baseline. Let's start working with it, right? Um, and and he turns to me and he goes, "Look, you're going to love it. It's great." I said, "Oh, this is going to be bad." <laughs> he goes, "He goes, if something were to happen to our rabbi, our elders would take over the congregation for for a few months, and then and we would run it in the day to day and teach and all that, and then we would develop a search committee to find a new rabbi." And then bring them in and, and so on and so forth. I'm like, that's, I said, dude, do you, do you hear yourself talking? He's like, huh? So that's not a succession plan. That's not a transition. Plan. That's a right. contingency plan. Right. That's if everything, if the crap hits the fan, what do we do to, to right, right the ship now? Yeah, that's, right. That's both a, rabbis went to Messiah conference. The plane went down. Exactly. They both died. That's a, that's a contingency right. plan. And, and one of the issues, uh, Rabbi Toby brought up Joshua and, and Caleb, uh, I mean, uh, Moses, Moses and Joshua, uh, on the way, on the way here. And, you know, Joshua served for 40 years under Moses. Uh, he was in the tent when, when, when Moses would go in to encounter the presence of God in the tent of meetings, Joshua would go in with him. Moses would come out to do whatever it is he needed to do. And Joshua stayed in place there. And he, the, the, the community witnessed the trust, the development, the relationship, the, right. the mentorship that Moses was feeding into and sowing into Joshua. So when the time came 40 years later for Joshua to take over and there to be a succession from Moses to Joshua, the congregation wasn't like shocked when this happened. They weren't trying to figure out, well, how do we relate to this guy? How do we plug it? This is a whole new system. What are we going to do now? They're going to change everything up because they knew what they were getting. They knew what to expect. They already right. had that relationship. And so if we're operating off of contingency plans, number one, we're not being good stewards of what God has placed in our care. Number two, we're, we're setting our communities up for failure because yep. I, I joked with Rabbi Toby on the way here because I, I, I'm an avid motorcyclist. I, I put ten to 15,000 miles a year on a motorcycle. I love being on two wheels. That's my preferred method of transportation. But with that also comes the reality that at any given moment, something could go horribly wrong, and that could be my last motorcycle ride ever and potentially my last breath ever. Um, and, and it's a horrible, dark thing to think of. But as a motorcyclist, that's something you just have to come to terms with. This could be it. Every ride I get on, this could be it. Um, and and, uh, and so I, I was joking with Rabbi Tobes, like, you know, we don't necessarily have something in writing, but I can tell you if something were to happen, if I take my bike out tomorrow, which is like thousand percent chance of thunderstorms tomorrow, so that's probably not going to happen. But if I take my bike out tomorrow and I go down and that's the end of it for me, we have somebody that our congregation's already got a relationship with, that they already trust, that they're already comfortable with. You would be taking the congregation over and running from there. Um, and, and, and you know the systems and the way we do things. You have ideas of what you can do from there and, and build upon it and whatever. But that's, that's our succession plan is we have somebody there. And a lot of these guys um, – they don't have anybody. They've never put the time and effort into raising up a Joshua, into raising up right. somebody. And and in doing so, not only raising someone, because there are people that I know that have uh, people that they hope will take over. Right. But but have they ever have had it, the conversation? Have the with conversation them? and and do it now. There there's some really good examples. For instance, uh, Alan Levine and Jude Caracello. Uh, they had yeah. a transition where they didn't wait until Alan was dead or dying or too old to move yeah. or any of those things, but they had a transition in place where they, where Alan showed his trust in Jude. Uh, didn't just, you know, sometimes we have people that we use in our congregations, and, and by we, uh, I guess we include ourselves in this also sometimes, but where we use them, but we don't put them in a, a way where people know we have absolute trust in who they are that that we've given them the the uh you know hold of the the baton uh to to follow to do when when somebody asks me about something rabbi jonathan does i say go ask rabbi jonathan i don't because i trust him i i, I so when he gives messages i don't get his messages critique them hand them back to them and tell him what to say you know we we talk about i i have uh, instilled as time went on. Now he's been here for three years. The the first time he he preached, I did say, okay, what are you going to talk about? Let's talk about this, and so on. But after three years of him being there, the, there's no doubt when the, when he gets up there, and it's no longer it used to be uh, that when I wasn't there, a good portion of the congregation wouldn't show up, or right. if, or if. They yeah. got there and saw I wasn't there. They would go back to their cars and leave. That's no longer the case. When, when, as a matter of fact, the last time uh, 
I was out of town. Rabbi Jonathan uh, was there, and we had a, a huge crowd. We had lots of visitors. We had, and it was like we. It, it was such a happy moment for me to know that he has become, in the eyes of the congregation, a Joshua, and mm-hmm. not some outsider who might, or that they don't trust, or they don't. They don't know. They have a relationship with him. They trust his prayer life. They trust his walk. They, they've heard him teach. They know where he comes from. All of those things. And it's so important because it, it takes away the opportunity for the vacuum. It takes away for that yeah. panic that people have should something happen. And the truth is that, that unfortunately, in many of our cases in the Messianic movement, uh, the transition concept is when I die or I get too sick to do this. Yeah. But the reality is that Long before, and I just was talking to a Rebbitzin, uh, one of my my friends' uh, wives. We were having a conversation about this, and she said she'd been talking with other Rebbitzin her age about how many of them really want their husbands to retire. Mm-hmm. Like their husbands are are old enough now, they should be retiring. They should be spending their sunset years with their wife. They should be visiting their grandchildren. Yeah. Uh, things like what Rabbi Rosenberg has done in. Uh, New York, where he's re- retired from it, and he's living in Chicago now with his son, and he's able to spend time with his grandchildren and do those things that you do. You know, biblically, you trained until you were 30. From 30 to 50, you served primarily. From 50 till whenever you died, you trained the next generation, right. helped, encouraged, consulted, and and we've not done that in our movement and to the detriment of both the young people coming up yes. and our spouses uh, in the process. Yeah. And so we need to change the way we think about these things. And I know a number of IMCS leaders and union leaders, UMJC leaders, who have nobody in their congregation that's in a place to, uh, to follow along, to take. And they have spouses that would like to spend the twilight uh, their, years. their twilight years together, not not getting out of ministry, but getting out of that respon- day-to-day responsibility where you're carrying the burden of the whole community on your shoulders, where you can pass it to the next generation and allow them to go. And it does a disservice to our wives, our family, our grandchildren. It does a disservice to our congregation. It does a disservice to the young people coming up that have a calling, but have no outlet for their calling. And all of these things are so important, and, and it it diminishes the effectiveness of our ministry, and it locks us into a place where we're limited in what we can do. Uh, if you have an assistant rabbi that's in your on your staff, somebody that you're with, you have the ability to grow in a way that you don't have if you're by yourself. You have ability to share responsibility of more coverage for the people in your community to pray for them, to help them, to minister to them. All of those things are vital to what's going on. And, and I can tell you as the the oldest one in this room, mm-hmm. you know, I'm in my 60s now. I know that realistically I've got 20 years left and I'd like to spend that 20 years doing ministry, but also spending time with my wife traveling, visiting, encouraging other leaders, maybe sharing the wisdom that God's given me over the years with other people to help them, spending time with my grandchildren. And, and, Book tour. Uh, mm. Well, and, and all, of, <laughs> all of the things, but, uh, but you, I, there's no way I could do that if I didn't have Jonathan. And the truth is we're looking for others to work alongside Jonathan. Yeah. Right. I, I think for me— um, so, and I think we spent the last like 10 minutes or so really, I think, developing a good foundation for what the problem is. Right. Um, but so let's look at, I think, the two, the, the two things that can happen if you don't do this, if you don't prepare, if you don't train up, if you don't, if, if you're a Moses and you don't have your Joshua, what's two things that's going to happen? Well, first off, I think the, the you have... Let me just look at history. I'm not saying I'm not comparing the kingdom of God to these historic. I'm saying this is human nature. This is what happens when Alexander the Great took over massive swaths of the known world. When he died, suddenly 
what happened to his massive swaths that he took over? Split. It split into four little parts between his four generals. Um, that's just one example. Uh, so if something happens to you and there's no plan, if you're a senior leader and something happens to you and there's no plan and you've not been showing the congregation that you have faith and trust in another leader or in a younger leader, or what I'm saying is if you if every time someone else speaks at the bema at your congregation and you aren't there you have a problem and you so you you have a risk of your congregation breaking apart folding you're going to lose people you you will you might have a core people that stick around but you're going to lose a lot of those people that are showing up to your event every week right. which is pretty much what you've made it you've 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 hinged the entire ministry around your personality. Right. That's what you've done. You, you've not really, your ministry that God has given you has become a cult of personality. Right. A, it's about your personality. That's the first problem. And we can go through both. The second problem, which uh, Rabbi Eric touched on a little bit, is any time someone leaves, and it is absolutely in Scripture, any time a leader dies or leaves, it creates a vacuum and it attracts the wrong types of people. And Rabbi Eric, before we hit record, said, yeah, it's like the shark circling. Or it's like if you're in the desert and the vultures are circling you. Yeah. Does it happen? Uh, well, let's see. When King David died, even he spent time telling all the congregation of Israel, like Solomon, my son. I, and, and David put work into preparing everything for his son to ascend the throne. But even with all of that, when David died, Adonijah showed up and tried to usurp Solomon. So you don't think that... You better believe that happens in the kingdom of God. So you have to be prepared. So even if you do have a successor, but if you don't, what I'm saying is when that person leaves, whether they quit or they die or they retire, here come, how are you going to know the difference between the sharks and the people who are there out of the goodness of their heart? You should have a plan. Right. And your elders, your your leadership team, even if you don't have somebody at your congregation that is the man that's going to take your place. Your elders should have a an outline, a plan for what to do. God forbid something happens, and, and go. And we have to understand. You know, I heard a, a young woman say uh, one time in a class that uh, that too many women settle f- instead of waiting for Mister Right, they settle for Mister Right now. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, many congregations, if they don't have a plan of what to do, and even if they're, like I said, if there isn't somebody in the congregation, where do we find one? How do we acquire one? How do right. we how do we advertise for it? What organizations are there yeah. we can reach out to so that you don't just stick whoever's in there? Because you can do a great deal of damage by letting mm-hmm. Mr. Right now right. Or, take or the saying, place. Or saying, uh, well, if something happens to me or whatever, well— the, it's gonna. We're, we're gonna have our elders come together. And I'm like, uh huh. And then you're gone. And w- what if your elders start fighting? And then what if your elders start taking people with them? And then, well, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. And then you got two congregations or three congregations or no congregation because it all imploded. Right. And it may have to be said if if you have five elders say, but none of them is gifted to be a shepherd or a rabbi. Right. It, that has to be said. Yeah. That okay, you guys. If something happens to me, don't fight amongst yourselves for who's going to be the the rabbi because none of you are called to do that. You guys need to work together to find somebody who is called. You guys can hold things together. You can teach. You know, an elder has to be able to teach, has to be able to do. But but if you if you have but it has to be said. You can't just because. If you have five men and all five of them are like, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. And then they all feel like, well, I have a responsibility to step up even if I'm not called. Right. And then they start fighting amongst themselves about who's going to be. You have a Rehoboam, Jeroboam situation. Yeah, that's what. Of who's going to be in charge now that dad's gone. And, you know, it, it becomes a problem. But these... These vacuum things, and again, we're, it's not just the succession plan; it's the understanding of the vacuum and how to deal with that. Uh, in not just congregationally, but we deal with this with Shabbat school leaders. Yeah, we deal with this with worship team. Yeah, leaders. it doesn't just apply to senior leaders. We no. we have a, a prison ministry that was very active, and our prison ministry leader had to step down because of family obligations. His parents got sick, and so on. We didn't just throw somebody in. I would rather not have somebody in that place 
right. and have the wrong person in there until God brings the right person in there. Yeah. I would rather use canned music for my worship than have the wrong person in as my worship leader. Right. Yeah. It's just really and, important. And what's the per- and, 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 so, and everybody's like, well, what do you, what does he mean by what does he mean by the sharks uh, circling? What does he mean by the vacuum? What 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 do we, what what do we what's the threat? What's the problem? Because you perhaps you've never met these people, and if you're listening, I think you probably have. It's people with a voracious desire to have authority and to be in control, to be seen. Right. And if, like I said, I'll give you just a brief story of when I was at a congregation and the worship leader left. This guy had been the worship leader for a while. Um, the ra- uh, the senior rabbi at the time had named me worship leader. It was kind of a freak thing, but um, I was named the worship leader. And let me tell you the conversations I had in the weeks after, all with musicians that suddenly just came out of the woodwork. Well, what's going on? Hey, what's going on? What's happening with the worship team? What's going on? What's going on? I'm like... And I just remember thinking, I'll tell you why they're talking to me, because the worship leader left. Yeah. It's the vacuum. One yeah. guy had not come in. Oh, we hadn't seen him in forever. And he showed up. Hey, what's going on, man? Yeah, well, what's happening? What's happening? I'm like, I'm telling you, man, there's people that will, they're opportunists. They will. And if you don't believe that, five chapters into Acts, you had Ananias and Sapphira. You had these types of people yeah. five chapters into Acts after the, the, the new Messianic com- community, after Yeshua left, and here they come. Yeah. So you have to you have to know. You have yeah. to watch out. Or the uh, who, Simon the Sorcerer. Right. right. Uh, you yeah. know, I, I don't want to live for God. I just want the power. Yeah. yeah. How can I buy that? Right. And, and the, the vacuum that you guys are talking about, that all goes back to what I said at the beginning, right? You fell to plan, you're planning to fail. Yep. We are charged to be stewards of the of our congregation. You know, the, the statement you just made, Rabbi Eric, about I would rather have n- nobody leading a ministry and, and not have that ministry active than have the wrong person. And we, we've had that conversation a thousand times in our congregation because I'm very intentional on in that same attitude. We just had it in a membership interview uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I always ask people in our membership interview, hey, where do you see yourself serving in the congregation? What area of ministry mm-hmm. do you see being the best fit for you, right? Not because that's necessarily where we're going to put you, but I, before we make thoughts on where we would like to see you work, I want to see where your heart is and what God's already speaking to you on. And uh, and they go, you know, honestly, just wherever wherever God wants to use me. And I was like, no, 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 that's not how this game is played here. Uh, you know, I'm, we're very intentional about we will not put somebody in a position just to fill a position. I don't want holes filled. I want the right people in the right place at the right time. Uh, Our Shabbat school coordinator approached us a couple of weeks ago and said, hey, uh, I'm not planning on going anywhere anytime soon. I'm not planning on stepping away, but I think it's time that we start to uh, develop a understudy, a number two That's great. for Shabbat school to start to, to, so that when the time comes, if something happens to me, if God calls me on elsewhere or whatever, that there's a plan in place or something place. there. Um, and, you know, and so our, our thing is we don't want to put somebody, we did do can music, Brett Am did too. We did can music for a very long time. I had gotten really good at making lyric videos uh, to have up on the screens uh, so that it was less distracting. There wasn't somebody having to run something. Everybody could worship until we had worship leaders, uh, until we had things in place. We did not have Shabbat school for years until we have the right people in place for that uh, and, and so on. And there are probably a 100 other ministry outlets that we could do at CMC that we aren't going to do until the right people are in place yeah, for that. And it's important for yeah. people to realize that it's okay not to have something. You yeah. know, we, we kind of think that, okay, we have a men's ministry, so if the men, the leader of that steps down or moves or whatever, we have to get someone in there because we have to have this men's ministry. Right. No, no, you don't. We were, we were, we're going through that with our own youth group. Right. We had, uh, we had youth leaders transition out, or Rabbi David, and, uh, you know, this is where I just, this is before we got there, but he didn't just stick to other people in that position. Right. Between me and Rabbi David and our wives, we are caretaking the yeah. youth ministry until right. you know. God because I would that say, up. I would say that youth ministry is probably one of the only avenues in congregational life that I don't think the not doing it because we don't have somebody to lead it is an option. Uh, particularly pu- because of the fact that, uh, and and I'll speak specifically to the Messianic movement. As a whole, our movement has not been good at 
actually mentoring and growing Retaining. young people for retention purposes no. that for their walk with not just for numbers in our seats but for their walk with the lord for their uh connectivity to messianic judaism and so on we have not been good at my entire generation that i grew up with in the ymj basically doesn't exist anymore in the mj mm-hmm. or in the messianic jewish movement like they've all gone off either they walked away from the lord or went to church or they went to churches or whatever but they're not in yeah. the movement anymore yeah, and, and a so, number of them went to Israel. Yeah. But, and so yeah. youth youth group like youth groups are the one area that if and and don't get me like youth ministry is not like that's not the thing my hands going up for. Uh, right. Like, I'm not volunteering for that one in a hurry, but as the rabbis of the congregation we felt it necessary just because we didn't have youth leaders anymore. They stepped away from that role. Uh, and, and and it wasn't like they didn't step away because they wanted to just some stuff that went on and, and it was clear that it wasn't going to work. So we, we had to uh, transition that and we did not feel it was uh, fair to the youth to say, well, we don't have anybody. So you're, you know, out of luck. We're just going to let you roll on your own. We, we figured, we felt it more important that we invest that time and energy and, yeah. and so into them and, and give them a place, um, and, and show them that love and compassion right. until God provides yeah. new yeah. leaders. But, but what I was saying, and, and I agree with you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in no, that, yeah. but what I was trying to say is there, for instance, if, in your case with your youth, uh, while you continued having events and things for your youth, you didn't have to do everything the previous leaders did. No. Correct. You just continued. And I was agreeing with you. We didn't just right, stick, right. find two yeah. warm bodies. Right, right. So, you know, when it comes sure. to certain things, like you're going to have worship. You may not have a worship leader, but you're right. going to have worship. So you transition to do something to keep that place until such a time as... Uh, as someone it. gets Don't raised up, yeah. Don't say it. As someone gets raised well, up, why this is so important is because um, year, some years ago, my, the first rabbi I served under um, gave me some really important advice um, when I went to him about adding a new member to the worship team. And he goes, "Have you prayed about it?" And I said, "Yeah, I've prayed about it. I really feel like the Lord has confirmed it." And he goes, "Okay." He goes, "The reason why I'm saying this is because putting them up there is easy, but taking them off." He goes, you have to rip them off. Right. One, of, go- the, one of the most important messages yeah. Rabbi Judah Hungerman ever taught at a rabbi's yeah. conference is it's easier to appoint than to disappoint. Oh, gosh, yeah. Well, because unless they do something egregious, like, I mean, egregious where it's just obvious, um, if they are, if they behave badly or something, like, what I'm saying is you can get a person up there with the wrong spirit and it can still be hard to take them off right. the stage, right. whether it's eldership, on the worship team, I had a I had a situation as a worship leader with a, a particular person. Do you know how long it took me to deal with this problem personality before they were gone? Four years, man. Because why? Because we're so nice. No, because look, you can't just do that. You you can't appoint somebody and then operate in grace and mercy with them and then rip them off in two weeks. Even if you're like, oh god, I can't. I made a bad decision. So you have to steward your ministry with care and. If you're not preparing um, the congregation for the future, what you're communicating is it's about me and mm-hmm. what I've done and what I'm doing right. and not about the fact that God has always been, I think, what he loved about the children of Israel. And how many times does it say when your children ask you, when your children ask you, when your children ask you, you are to say God is about if you love me, you'll share me, not keep right. these right. things. And, yeah. and you said something, Rabbi Toby, earlier that, that really hit something really strong. And I don't know if, if, if it was uh, picked up enough. But mm-hmm. when, when we have people, like I have people that I bring in to speak at our congregation regularly, we quite often have people there and, and that speak from other ministries. I have Rabbi Jonathan speak even when I'm in the service. It's not, so the, the point I'm trying to make is that, that there are times we put people in places. Mm-hmm. There's times we take them out of places regardless. And it doesn't mean that there's right or wrong going on. Right. In other words, you can use somebody to teach because it's a season for them to teach and then them not teach because it's no longer that season. Right. And if you don't teach your congregation that transition happens outside of sin, mm-hmm. outside of immorality. So if you bring someone into the worship team for a period of time, and then they feel like like we had one of our worship leaders, uh, one of our worship team members who came up to me and he said, hey, Rabbi, I'm, I'm, I'm not in sin or anything, but 
I just need to take some time to, to right. work on my, 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 my t- myself, to, to pray. To, I, I want to strengthen myself. I don't feel like I've been praying, seeking, doing as much as I should to be a worship leader, that there's a, a higher level of responsibility spiritually to be up here. And I'm, Now, he wasn't in sin. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He just felt like, and, and if we don't deal with our congregations to where when that person steps down and they see him sitting in the congregation that they assume there's sin in his life or something right. going on, we've also did a dis- disservice to our, and that opens that whole vacuum of, of yeah. things from a whole different thing because then it va- the instead of it being bodies coming in to fill the void, gossip, innuendo, rumors, and things fill the, those voids. I think if the Apostle Paul were to look at the way some of these senior leaders are behaving, I think he'd say, are you nuts? He goes, do, do you know? I mean, because when you read the scriptures and Paul's epistles, he was so eager to, to, to be a channel for the authority of the Holy Spirit and empower men like Titus and Timothy and, and, and these people, you know? Um, and I think, it, I, I, I think Paul was never one to say, I mean, he did so much of his ministry from prison, from prison and he's telling Timothy, like, Timothy, just keep going, man, keep going. You know, and one of the things I love about Paul, I mean, when we talk about, for instance, Mark, yeah, you know, Paul raises him up, and then sets him down, and then raises him back up again. Oh yeah, and there, it's it's not a one and done. It's not like okay, right. you're, you're out of here. There's no opportunity. These voids that we're talking about, these these vacuums, uh, happen for good reasons. We have uh, two of our worship leaders had babies. Yeah. You know, they were the leaders of the worship team, and they had a baby, and suddenly it wasn't a bad thing. There wasn't a sin. It wasn't a horror. It yeah. wasn't somebody died. Something wonderful happened, and we had a void that came in, and you have to yeah. have plans for, for these things. So it's when we're talking about these things, we're not just talking about bad things, no. but just life that brings changes, but, and we need to prepare our congregation for change dynamically. And we need to remember what Jethro told Moses are you crazy trying to do everything on your own? Yeah. Are you leading worship, doing the opening, doing all this stuff, leading the liturgy, reading the Torah, doing the and yeah. giving the message and doing the, you know, and your wife is doing the books, right. the records, the sh- Shabbat school, the worship team, the and, and let's not even like that's a whole other day's conversation on what the expectation on the the rabbi's wives are, which is just entirely unfair and unrealistic. And their children. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that um, for me, when I when I think of Paul being the way he was, just incredibly humble with the gift that had been given him. But you know, all the while while he's raising up Timothy and Titus and guys like this, uh, young men and young women, um, he also would say out of the other side of his mouth, "By the way, I have no business being called an apostle." And I think some of that attitude's been lost. I mean, yeah. because. I just, I feel like the attitude is not. Well, is, you know. and largely it's a cultural thing. Like that's, you know, you. The, Understanding it was never coming to him. Right. Well, and there's, I, I hate to say it this way, but you kind of have to look at when the resurgence of the Messianic movement was, mm-hmm. which was kind of at the mid range or even the height of when um, our uh, pop culture evangelicalism Right. kind of came about where you really like before before the 60s and 70s yeah your pastor was a local guy yeah yeah he was the local yeah. pastor he sold tomatoes and stuff during the week to pay right. for right. the power bill your at the church. Pri- if you were catholic your priest he was the priest of the right. local parish like he wasn't like famous on youtube or instagram or yeah. vine or tiktok or whatever but like 60s and 70s opened up TV pastors, radio pastors. The sort so suddenly now you could be up in front and with that comes, and be yeah. known. Mm-hmm. And people like that feeling, and I think that spirit has largely it it it, it, it prevents people from being able to be humble um, in a lot of these cases. Yeah, and I I don't think that that means that that doesn't mean that uh, those people because they want the attention are bad. What I would say if someone's when I see a person who likes attention and wants to be famous or wants to be known, I think, well, that's just human condition. That's what your flesh wants. Right. That's normal. We all have what that. What I'm saying is it prevents, that's what prevents the, you know, we've, and we've 
joked about it before on here that you know we've heard people say like you know I'll, I'll turn over my congregation yes you can pry it from my cold dead hands to the the next generation yeah. the next up and no i was like, yeah and, and i was totally agreeing with you i was yeah. i was just saying that i think that it's totally normal to combat that i think we don't warn our young leaders enough of the right. dangers of success we want yeah. them to be successful but we don't understand that you know there is a risk that comes with visible success sure right. i i think that you know, to me, and having Rabbi Jonathan in place where he is has given me something that, that really is a blessing. And that's, I'm, I'm so thankful and grateful that we have hundreds of people that come to our synagogue right. every week to hear me teach. But I'm also thankful now that if I'm not there, they're still going to come. Yeah, that's That, that those priceless. people are, are, are coming because there's right. a a culture of worship, a culture of being part of a community, a culture. And it's not about me. If, if And I'm going on vacation in a couple of weeks. And when I do, everybody's going to come because it's not, uh, although people come because of the leader. And that's just, as you said, human nature. Some people of that's want, just going to happen. It's going to happen. But but they come now they're they're coming not just because of me and if if god forbid something happened to me next week our congregation would continue there'd be sadness but they would continue going yeah. on right. without uh a speed bump without dro- you know falling apart without and it has to be that way not just with the congregation leader but the worship leader the shabbat school leader the own egg director everybody in the congregation the co- culture of the congregation has to be such that people are doing it for God, right? And that the continuum of the congregation should continue. And I was talking to somebody last week, and I said that we purposely we had a visitor come and he said, "Man, it's amazing that you have all these people that stay here for hours after your service is over with and just want to hang out." And I said, "That's because we our culture is that we're building a community, and out of a community, a congregation was birthed." Yeah. Rather than the other way around. And if, if, if you're about the congregation, about the, the people in the pews, about having somebody there, about performing, about having a message that is better than every other message everywhere. You'll just have a nice service. You're going to have a nice service and go on. And then if something happens, there will be that vacuum. Oh, yeah. But if you build a culture of community where people just want to be with each other, regardless of who's going to be speaking or who's leading the worship or who's doing the liturgy that particular week or whatever, then then it changes everything. And I think that's the culture that we're trying to talk about is a culture that fills, that doesn't allow a vacuum to be formed. Mm -hmm. Something that, that is purposely set in motion with the understanding that people change all the time, that, that there's going to be rotation. There's, there's going to be a different person doing things and uh, and that we it, it's a regular norm, right? That that you know. As a matter of fact, someone asked me the other the other day if I was taking the month off because Rabbi Jonathan taught, and then we had Rabbi K- Kokev Gadamu teach, and this week Rabbi Arroyo is going to be here, and then uh, you know so and that's it. January's over, right? And January's over, and but I didn't take a month off. I've been here the whole time. Yeah, it's just that I don't have to be in the bima in order for me to feel like I'm leading the congregation Mm -hmm. and being a shepherd. And my people don't need me to be in the Bema in order for them to feel like they're part of the congregation and I'm the rabbi. Right, and I can say, just because I'm present for a lot of stuff, that there's been a lot of shepherding this month that's not, like, (laughs) teaching related <laughs> right a lot of stuff going on this particular month is like oh wow we're dealing with a lot well yeah that was what so. and that was what impressed me i think that i wasn't used to when i came here and rabbi david started to have me speak as he i mean because it was a, a transition like if you could put it on a graph it just it slowly went up and i think right. that that was very purposeful and meaningful and um but i just remember uh, being at the Bema and speaking and at the back there's David and he's actually, he's actually still doing stuff right. uh, behind the scenes. But I'm like, man, that's, that's real humility too. Like I was like, wow, he's here. Right. And he's allowing me to come up here and giving me this opportunity. And right. that is a level of humility that the congregation is witnessing him exercise. Right. 
And um, it says, and David knows that that says less about him and more about God because what it's saying is, is that David's saying, listen, it's the same spirit, it's the same power, it's the same God, it's the same calling. Right. So it was very humbling for me to see him back there because I'm going to yeah. be honest with you, in my years leading up to coming to CMC, I was not used to that. I was used yeah. to, I'm going out of town, we'll throw a warm body up there. It's only for a week. Yeah. Right. And I'll tell you this, that one of the biggest blessings of, of having this type of culture where I don't have to be up on the Bema mm-hmm. is I get to sit with my wife during service. You know, for something for you years, didn't get to do for years. Yeah, for years, I didn't get to sit with my wife during service. I didn't get to be with her and worship standing next to her and right. be part of that. So it's it's a, a cultural shift that that is allowed. But if in the same way that at our congregation and same thing with CMC, we plan months in advance for things. Mm-hmm. We're we're not. It's not like every week. We're sitting there wondering, what are we going to do this Shabbat? What are we going to do next Shabbat? What are we doing? This? We're six months out planning events, planning things happening. The same way we are uh, culturally with leadership, with people doing things, with stuff. It isn't. We're, we're not reacting to things. We're not reactive. We're proactive. We're, we're putting people in place, doing things. And we're watching and we're saying, okay, let's raise this person up a little bit and see where they are. Okay. Right. Maybe they aren't ready for that. Let's, let's bring it down a little bit. So we don't put them in place and then hurt them right? yeah. or break their spirit. Or others in the process. So I wanted to ask about, or not ask, but kind of present it because we're not just complaining for the, 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 the last, I guess, you know, I know we're kind of getting into the downhill part of the episode, but the application part, because somebody might be listening saying, well, how would we even begin to do that? What does that look like? Oh, yeah, is that what you were going into? When, when you're done, yeah. No, no, because well, what I was telling you, for me and David, I guess the thing that came to my mind was literally it was like he was a pilot. And he came in and said, okay, sit next to me. And literally that's how it is to this very day when I'm talking. Yeah. It's like I'm, I'm like – I'm sitting next to him and he's flying and then he, but I have stuff to do. Right. But sometimes he'll say, Hey, I'm going to kick the stick up, you know, the control stick over to you. Yeah. And then he'll give it to me and then I'm doing it and I've made mistakes and I've clipped stuff and we've, I, I've flat, have almost gotten a spin a couple times, broken but that's the land, broken the landing gear, but that's because it was so gradual. And then David will say, okay, you know what? Let me, here's what, you know, and all the while we're flying, I'm like, Hey, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with that? What happens if the plane does this, you know? And, and one of the things that Rabbi David did with you that yeah. I had never really thought of that uh, we're implementing, in, and so I like to learn from other people to overcome things I didn't do right or, or right. may not have done, is when he brought you in mm-hmm. to be the assistant rabbi, I think you spent a month or more just being a congregant. I think it was three months. Yeah, it was what, three what, months. Three months just being a congregant. Yeah. In other words, he allowed you to build a relationship with people in a congregational community yes. level before they you started having to be the leader right. and, and talking. So it, it allowed relationship to build. It allowed that foundation yes. to be built. And, and it was something that I said, well, that, that was brilliant. Oh. Now, right. I, I didn't do that with Jonathan. But, I wish I had yeah, in some ways but, to, to do that. But well, it was it yeah. was something that I said, this is powerful. And, and again, it, it allowed uh, community to build so no vacuum was formed. There wasn't yeah. a, who is this guy coming from wherever that's suddenly my boss? Yeah. And I know that, and I'm using the airplane, but I'm thinking about like the passengers are like the congregation and they're sitting right. there and they're like, they know David can fly the plane, but they also know that, well, hey, Toby just flew it a little bit, you know? Yeah. And 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 so and David has been gradually kind of right. you know switching over to that. So and the, so the congregation knows okay, well he can fly the plane too. Yeah. And Dave and we know that David flies the plane most of the time, and that's how it should be. But I, I just think that's what's been powerful about it is that gradual um, uh, uh, confidence that he's that he right. while he's sitting there, the congregation's watching it too. And I think that that's you know. Yeah. Has been right. where at least at least they can still see that he wears the captain's bars on yeah, his jacket. Where, where you know? unfortunately, in many congregations, the the way the congregation meets their next leader is at the funeral of the right. previous leader. Oh. Yeah, and I, I do want to throw out one other thing too. With the yeah, you know, we gave that three month window for them to um, familiarize themselves with the congregation, build relationships with the congregation, right. uh, and and but with that, like he was. 
learning the details of what we do and how we do on the background and, and so on. But uh, in that time where we were very intentional for these three months, you have zero responsibilities. You're here to to plant yourself in the congregation. We started paying him then. Right. We didn't wait until the three months was up to start paying him and right. like see if this is going to pay. Like that was we started paying them yeah. uh, his salary then, uh, even though he wasn't actively responsible for anything. Uh, that that still counted in his his kind of time of service and so on in the congregation. Yeah. You were they, gonna say, yeah, yeah. Well, well I was. Uh, we're talking about practical yeah, implementation pr- of this. The, one of the things that we're doing, and we had started talking about last year, was that you know we're looking to kind of develop a circle of teachers. We, you know, we want to have more than just Rabbi Eric and myself, and so people who are qualified. Because you know, like it or not, they may be. They may. We'd like the people who are qualified, not just so we can, um, you know, use them mm-hmm. and ask them to do things. But so that, you know, God willing, if there's a congregation elsewhere that needs a leader, it, like there's a pool, you know, people can be like, oh, Bradam's got a pool of four other people that aren't actively employed by the synagogue that are qualified to teach. Right. And to, are you going to set up a transfer portal next? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, you know, one of the things that we, we started, um, we're, we're ha- so we're, we're, we got a couple people in mind that were in a few people in mind that we're kind of, you know, talking to and teaching and, uh asking to hey prepare teaching for tuesday nights you know which is when we do our typically it's a a thematic study or a bible a book of the bible study and we have them come in and teach and one of the things that we did was we put out a sadaka box and said you don't have to but if you would like to just show your appreciation for there these people who are not employed by the synagogue but took time to pray to study to read and to prepare a teaching um you know please feel free to give just to show gratitude because we believe in allowing the ox to, you know, eat as it treads out the grain. And so, you know, allowing, if you're going to raise people up or Mm -hmm. even think about it, they need to, like you were paid before you even were like actively, you know, serving in the role that you were brought to be there for. They need to be shown that there is a future for them in that, that there is a, like you are appreciated in this potential place that you exist in. So that way, and cause you know, if it doesn't work out, um, like for example, that like, obviously they may not, they, they, they may never be employed full time here at Bradam, but elsewhere they'll have already received a taste of what that feels like to be appreciated to right. be, to know. And then they can take that elsewhere and go, here's how I need my, here's how I need to be treated. Here's how my family needs to be treated. Um, to be a teacher. Yeah. And if you're not planning for that, and that's a really easy thing to do, set out a Sadaka box. You got a couple people you think, you know, God's calling for to, up to teach it, maybe even to be in leadership, begin giving them opportunities yeah, to, to teach and to even be, um, you know, appreciated for it uh, fiscally and be present for it and be present for it. Don't just, just be like, not when you're all right, yeah. man, here you go. It's all your, yeah, and leave. Yeah, less, no, be yeah. present for it. And then there's, um, you know, and, and I would say if you can, if your synagogue has the money, even allow them to take some of the classes in the IMCS Yeshiva to pursue mm-hmm. ordination as a teacher. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, because that takes a couple years. You know, I mean, you can do it quicker than two, a couple years. But if, if they're doing it kind of, you know, at, the, at, a, at, a, at a working adult's pace, you know, allow them to fully enter into that role. And if they, if they do, and they get you know, licensed and ordained, and then you, you've brought up now a teacher and you have someone available to you or someone else. So one thing I want to throw into this conversation, especially if you're a congregational leader or a ministry leader, uh, and are listening to this episode and going, man, I want to start implementing some of this in, in our community and, and developing towards um, uh, building up a longevity for our congregation and so on. One of the biggest uh, piece of advice that I can give that I think would be a tremendous resource would be to utilize Strength Finders. Go buy the book Strength Finder uh, 2.0. Read through it. There's uh, there's a quiz that comes with it that will will kind of tell you what your uh, top five strengths are. You can see how you can best implement in your role in that. But put your team through Strengths Finders, and there are some free online quizzes that are uh, that the same thing as Strengths Finders, just it's not that brand that are available. But utilize these resources because one of the big and, and by the way, Strengths Finder is it's used in the business world, but it actually was originally developed by believers for. 
ministry. Uh, it just happened to also work really well in the business world as well. But the whole goal to it is you find out what your strengths are. And in turn, you find out what your weaknesses are and your best, you're going to be the best you can be in your role by operating within your strengths Mm -hmm. and building a team around you that makes up for your weaknesses. Uh, And so for instance, uh, and I'll just use my wife and, and myself as an example, I have like on my strengths finders, empathy is one of the the strengths and it is not in my list. Like I'm, I'm almost certain they left it off altogether, (laughs) but my wife is super empathetic and it's actually empathy is her top strength. And so we're able to balance each other in, in really unique ways because, and the same uh, Rabbi Toby and, and rabbits and Brooke, their strengths finders were some things overlap with ours, but there are others that like, I have certain strengths that Rabbi Toby doesn't have. And he has strengths that I don't have. And yeah. we're able to, to support each other and bolster each other because we're making up for each other's weaknesses. And by the way, admit that you have weaknesses because that's the, I know oh, yeah. a lot of, a lot of congregational leaders think they've got to be this like Herculean figure that you. Mm. Dude, right. people need to know that you're a human too. Like, don't let folks put you on a pedestal that they you, you think you can't fail. They think you can't fail, whatever, because I right. guarantee you're going to fail then. Right. Uh, and it's going to be public. It's going to be horrible. Uh, people need to understand you're human just like they are. It might so, be at the hot tub, so you got to watch out. <laughs> oh, at the Rosen Plaza. Um, oh, Lord. So, uh, but, but seriously, take advantage of resources like Strengths Finders. Put your team through it so you can determine who can do what best and how to to facilitate a cohesive structure in your community uh, for that longevity purpose. And, yeah. and one last thing I want to throw out there is that um, – Along with knowing what your strengths are, find people who have strengths in those areas and put them in place. Because sometimes when we have a weakness in an area, we end up putting someone just as weak right. in that place because we don't want to do it. So we'll put some someone else there. Uh, and, and that'll also keep from having those voids or those um, those places where the, the draft is, where the the vacuum becomes because things don't get dropped. They don't get missed. They don't get left off. They get taken care of. And so it's really important to find the right people to put in those places and to allow them to stumble and pick back up and get going again. Just because somebody dropped the ball one time doesn't mean you don't use them again or they aren't called to do something. Uh, We see all kinds of examples in the scripture. Peter is a great example of someone who uh, failed miserably, yeah. uh, and then God used him in fantastic and amazing ways. So part of that fill in the void is, 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 yeah, is yeah. allowing someone to grow in that position mm-hmm. and in that place yeah. uh, and to be there with them and to, uh, to understand those things. So it's really important as we talk about this that uh, every congregation is going to have voids, it's going to have vacuums at times, but... The, the damage that's done because we don't prepare to deal with those things. You know, in an airplane, when that wall came out, that door opened up, there's a whole plan for what to do in case yeah. that happens that's in place before it happens. And it happens immediately yeah. right. when things go And it goes into goes place in immediately. And everybody, that everybody hopes they never have to use. Right. But it's like when you go on a cruise. Like, we'll be on a cruise in a few weeks. You go on a cruise. doesn't matter how many times you've been on a cruise – the very first day that you're on the boat within usually like an hour before it sails, everybody has to go to a muster station. They got to run you through the whole rundown of the, the evacuation plan. And in the case of fire, this, and mm, this right. is where everybody it doesn't matter if you've gone on a thousand cruises or it's your very first cruise, everybody has to go through and, and, and understand the, now, you know, Six drinks later, you probably forgot it anyways, but still, no. <laughs> they have the, a plan. But the reality is that that's a great example. Every congregation should have a muster drill right. pr- plan for every position, for every event that they can think of, and practice, go, kind of talk about it, go through it, deal with it, so that if, God forbid, something happens, if somebody gets sick, if somebody's in a car accident, if somebody has a baby, which is a wonderful thing, that you're not scrambling trying to figure out what are we going to do, but you have it in place to take care of it. So it's not just a secession plan, which is just a small part of this discussion, Sure. but it's understanding that as congregations grow, you're going to have people that have kids. You're both, And nowadays, both the husband and the wife 
take time with the kids, which is a good thing. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. Right. But they may have to be out for four weeks, six weeks, taking care of the baby, doing doing those things. And, and somebody may get a job promotion, and suddenly they can't be in the in the position they were in. So there's good reasons that these vacuums get formed. But if we're doing our job the right way, then we'll have a plan in place for when that vacuum happens that we're immediately dealing with it. So the least amount of damage to our congregation, right. the least amount of damage to, because it, it doesn't just affect our congregation, it affects our testimony, and it can can destroy uh, things in, in the process that's really something we need to learn to avoid. And with that said, we appreciate you uh, joining us for this episode. We pray that it was a blessing to you, and uh, we look forward to chatting with you, or I guess more accurately, at you again next week. Thank you for listening to the Messy Antics Podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can be notified every time we drop a new episode. And be sure to follow and interact with us on social media at Messy Antics Podcast. 